Let's look to the Lord. Father in heaven, we are grateful today, as we are each and every day, that you awaken us, Lord, from a night of sleep, bringing us safely through, Lord. We are blessed to be in your house this morning as we recognize and observe Palm Sunday, the day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem to begin the final week of his life on earth, dear Lord, as it was just a few days past that, that the crucifixion took place, and then on the third day he rose again from the dead, proving once and for all to all who would question the fact that he was, is, and always will be God. And Lord, for that we are forever grateful. We are thankful, Lord, that you have brought us into your house this morning. We're thankful that we have your word in front of us. Uh, at every turn, Lord, there is no excuse for anyone, especially in America today, to not have a Bible or to not have access to the word of God. We're grateful, Lord, that you have revealed your, your everlasting truths to us. And so, Lord, we uh, come to you this morning with all praise, honor, and glory, and uh, we lift it all up to you, Father, uh, you and you alone. And so, Lord, bless our our service today. Uh, bless our remembrance of that uh, Sunday 2,000 years ago uh, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem, why he rode into Jerusalem, uh, what was about to be accomplished, dear Lord. Uh, bless us, uh, and again, encourage us, Lord, as our faith continues to strengthen. Our faith continues to, to build uh, to the point, Lord, where we pray that you would use us to share this wonderful gospel message with those whose paths we may cross. Lord, we thank you so much. This is uh, really the, the high point of the Christian year, Lord. We do celebrate his birth. We celebrate uh, other parts of Jesus' life throughout the year. Uh, but this week in particular, Lord, this is the week uh, that uh, we should proclaim it, we should herald it to all the world that Jesus Christ is God. Jesus Christ has come to save. So, Lord, we thank you for the blessings that we receive uh, in knowing these things. We thank you, dear Lord, for the blessings that you continue to shower upon us. Uh, we are not worthy. Uh, we have fallen in so many ways. Your word tells us that we fall short of the glory of God. And so, Lord, we humble ourselves today. We seek your forgiveness for our individual sins, our corporate sins. Uh, Lord, all that we have done <clears throat> wrongly, all that we have uh, done to perhaps... Uh, lift ourselves up and not you. Forgive us, Lord. Um, we are a, a, a proud people, and that's and that's wrong, Lord. We need to uh, worship you and lift you above uh, anything, anything that might come into our hearts or our minds. And so, Lord, bless us each this morning. We come to you with uh, with with different uh, petitions. Uh, some of us are struggling um, with health. Some of us are uh, struggling emotionally. Some of us are uh, struggling with with uh, business or with school, uh, with work. Whatever the case may be, Lord, you you know what is on our hearts, and we ask, Lord, that that you would touch us and and heal us, Lord, make us whole again, keep us focused on Jesus, Lord. The things of this life are so temporary. Uh, the challenges, the troubles, as difficult as they may appear when we are in the midst of them, uh, they shall soon pass, and yet others will come and take their place. And so, Lord, we need to keep our eyes on things eternal. We need to keep our eyes on you, Father, and, and look at our life and the world through your perspective. Help us, Lord, and, and in so doing, uh, we might help others along the way as well. Uh, Father, we pray for our missionaries who are around the world. Keep them safe. They are on the front line, and we uh, pray uh, 
their safety during times of persecution, uh, perhaps even martyrdom, dear Lord. We know many Christians uh, will lose their lives today simply because they're trusting in Christ. And so, Lord, we, we ask uh, for your protection. We uh, pray for our nation as well, Lord. We continue to pray that uh, you would be merciful. Uh, we deserve judgment, but Lord, we pray for the sake of, of the righteous in the land that you would uh, continue to have mercy on us, protect our freedoms, protect our our men and women around the world uh, who are serving, dear Lord. We, we pray that you would bring them all home safely as well. Uh, but Lord, most of all, again, bless this day uh, and, and, and what it means. Uh, have us uh, ponder these things in our heart, Lord. Uh, again, that we might uh, not only get a, a, a deeper understanding, but a deeper appreciation uh, for all that Jesus has done for us. I ask all these things in, in his precious name. Amen. We've mentioned several times already, but because it's the first of the month, uh, coming up, we will have the ladies' Bible study on Thursday at uh, 7.30. Preceding that at 7 is uh, the prayer group will meet. All are invited to come and pray uh, down in the fellowship hall at 7 uh, p.m. on Thursday. We will have our Wednesday night Bible study. We will have our Tuesday afternoon Bible study. Uh, Friday, you see our Good Friday service at 7 p.m. Uh, right here, we will observe the Lord's Supper as we do each Good Friday. Uh, because we're observing the Lord's Supper on Friday, we will uh, do that in lieu of observing it on Sunday. We like to observe our communion on the first Sunday of every month, but we will just move that up a couple of days to Friday. So that will be uh, observed uh, Friday evening, Saturday morning, uh, monthly men's prayer breakfast at Bob Evans on Joppa Road at 7.30. Come and join us if you are able to do that as well. Uh, because of uh, the flooding going on out in the yard every time it rains, you may not notice uh, that we had quite a crew here yesterday doing a, a, a really good job of spring cleaning uh, not just outside, inside the, the windows uh, up in the balcony were cleaned and uh, the, the windows along the sanctuary were cleaned and downstairs. Uh, just so much was done. I just, I, I always uh, hesitate to name names because I don't want to forget anyone, but I thank everyone who was here yesterday and was able to help uh, beautify the Lord's house. And uh, we need to have the Lord's house uh, looking good, we're making a statement uh, in the community that we're here, first of all, and uh, we want them to know uh, that it's important to us to uh, uh, to keep the blessing that God has given us uh, as a as a proper uh, a proper um, light to the world, and so that they can uh, see they see how good it looks outside. We want to get them inside. So invite your friends. Again, this is a terrific time of year. Uh, the name of Jesus is in the public square, and um, this is a time when people uh, who generally, they may uh, consider themselves Christians, but they're not necessarily churchgoers, but they'll come out on Christmas or Easter, invite them to join with us. We have a very important message for them. We also uh, are collecting... Uh, a new group of donations beginning next Sunday. You see here washable markers, pens, pencils, and erasers in the, in the green box inside the door downstairs as we collect for Operation Christmas, John. And we thank all of you who, uh, who take part in that. Uh, we'll have our final practice of the Resurrection Choir after church today. So those of you who are singing with us, please meet up here in the front of the sanctuary right after the service. Uh, also, you have a handout in your bulletin, and you will see words displayed on the overhead. Uh, Susan is going to play uh, the Via Dolorosa for us, which is a beautiful song. We ask you to follow the words, but do not sing. They are there just to be read while she is playing, and you can 
uh, reflect uh, and meditate on the meaning of these words. And again, we thank Susan. As we do, thank Jack and Mello uh, Vaith for their uh, instrumental prelude in the morning as well. To come in here and prepare your hearts properly uh, for worshiping the Lord. Uh, I hope everyone got a palm. If you didn't, uh, we've, we've got plenty in the back. Make sure you get one on the, on the way out. Uh, again, your offerings, we, we don't uh, collect them like we used to do traditionally because of uh, all the confusion with the virus. Just place it in the basket on your way out. We are much appreciative of, uh, of your faithfulness there. So with that, I'm looking around. I don't see any other notes that I've overlooked. So let's enjoy uh, the gift that God has given to Susan, uh, the gift of music. Thank you.
Thank you, Susan. That was, that was beautiful. The uh, youth that are can be dis dismissed now for their church. Instructors are heading back. <clears throat> you please stand for the uh, scripture reading. Brother Mike's on his way up to read it for us. Today's reading is from John chapter 12, verses 12 through 19. On the next day, much people that were come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, sat thereon as it is written. Fear not, daughter of Sion, Behold, thy king cometh sitting on an ass's colt. These things understood not his disciples at the first. But when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that these things were written of him, and that they had done these things unto him. The people, therefore, that was with him when he called Lazarus out of the grave and raised him from the dead, bear record. For this cause the people also met him, for that they had heard that he had done this miracle. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, Perceive ye how ye prevail nothing? Behold, the world has gone after him. And a pastor's message, King of the Jews. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Mike. Susan, thank you for the music. Amen is right. So there's a lot going on as Jesus enters into Jerusalem at the beginning of the week. Again, the day that we refer to as Palm Sunday, for all the obvious reasons, you're either holding one right now or it's laying next to you on the pew. But it's in the sovereignty of God that he has decided that all eyes will one day be upon Jerusalem. It will, it really always has been, but it will become so much more obvious as being the epicenter of his revealed will. Jerusalem is really at the center of all that went on in our text today that Mike read for us. It's not only a city where our Lord spent much of his life, it's also the city where he gave his life. And it will be the city where he makes his return and from which he will rule for a thousand years. So scripture exhorts us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. That, in fact, is what the name means, Yerushalayim. And you hear the root word shalom in there, peace. David says to pray for the peace of Jerusalem in Psalm 122, verse 6. And we know that true peace will only come when the Prince of Peace returns to establish his rule. The prophet Zechariah makes that very clear in the sixth chapter of the book that bears his name. He says the Messiah will sit on David's throne in the rebuilt temple of Jerusalem when he comes again in all his glory. So to pray for the peace of Jerusalem then takes on a special meaning because it's also a prayer for the return of our Lord and Savior. And of course, it is he and he alone who will bring peace. 
to Jerusalem, the peace that we have been praying for for these many, many years. Now, Jerusalem has quite a history. Uh, during the history of Jerusalem, it's been destroyed twice. It's been besieged 23 times, attacked 52 times, captured and recaptured 44 times. A lot of people are very interested in the city of Jerusalem. It's without a doubt the most prime piece of real estate in the entire world. Now I tell you all of that because today the status of Jerusalem remains as one of the core issues in the ongoing, seemingly ever-going, Israeli-Palestinian conflict. A conflict, by the way, which will have an end. Although they are currently the main players on the stage, there are others around the world who have a vested interest as well in the city of Jerusalem. It's home to some of the holiest sites of the world's three Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. The Temple Mount is the most sensitive location. It's the location of Solomon's Temple, which stood from the time he built it, the 10th century before Jesus, until the Babylonians destroyed it in 586 B.C. The, sec the second temple was then constructed on the same site and stood from 515 B.C. until the Romans destroyed it in the year 70 A.D. The Temple Mount is also the third holiest site of the Muslims. It houses two of their major Islamic shrines. One is the Dome of the Rock, which was built in the late 7th century. It houses the rock which Muslims believe Muhammad ascended into heaven from to receive the commandment for Muslim prayers. The second shrine of the Muslims is the Al-Aqsa Mosque, which is the largest mosque in Jerusalem. And that was completed early in the 8th century. Not far from the Temple Mount, in what is known as the Christian Quarter of Jerusalem, stands the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. It was originally built by the Roman Emperor Constantine in the 4th century at Golgotha, the site, of course, where Jesus was crucified. The church is venerated by many Christians as the location of Jesus' tomb, it's a major site also each year for Christian pilgrimage. So as you can see, many people have an interest in the happenings in and around Jerusalem. Has anyone been to Jerusalem here? I know a few of you have visited that holy city. Amen. It will be more and more in the news as we continue uh, to move forward. The Palestinians, of course, seek UN recognition of Palestine as a sovereign state, which would then make Jerusalem, in their eyes, well, it's already in their eyes, their capital. They believe that belongs to them. And of course, with that, the Jewish people would have to leave. In 1995, the late Yitzhak Rabin, who was former prime minister of Israel, declared that Jerusalem would always be the capital of Israel. Of course, he was just reiterating what God had previously said thousands of years before that. And now, of course, President Trump has moved our embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, recognizing it as, in fact, the true capital. Embassies are supposed to be located in capitals. As far as the Jews leaving Jerusalem, that's not going to happen because the bottom line is the Jewish people are not going anywhere. 
In fact, all of the recent discoveries, and there have been a multitude of them in, uh, I, I guess, in the last 20 years, the last 10 in particular, uh, discoveries of natural gas and oil deposits in Israel and off of its coastline are turning out to be so huge that many are now speculating that Israel may become one of the biggest world players in exporting energy. And so this development then just adds to the list of players who are interested in getting their hands on the nation of Israel. It's awakened, of course, all the, uh, the greed around the world. Everyone has their eyes on that piece of real estate. Ezekiel prophesied over 2,500 years ago that the battle of Gog and Magog would be fought over the resources that are found in Israel. The prophet spoke of Russia and Iran and Turkey and Libya forming a coalition with other nations to attack Israel, to take a spoil from the land. And that spoil, again, uh, includes many things, not the least of which are the gas, the oil, and the precious minerals, minerals that are very important uh, in, in the use of um, making uh, computers, making the parts that go into uh, the, the, um, the space program, uh, the spacecraft that are sent into outer space. Uh, all of this is very important, and of course, where we are in history right now, that has taken on uh, even more importance as more and more people are getting involved uh, in space programs. Again, all of this seemingly unrelated information is important when we remember whose land this is and why. God gave this land to Abraham. He gave it to Abraham so that his people who would come through the lineage of Isaac, not Ishmael, but Isaac, would possess it. And then 2,000 years after that promise was given to the patriarch, Christ, the Savior of his people, would be born. And Christ, of course, has been noted in his genealogies in Matthew and Luke. And that all happened, that all was a result of the promise that was given to Sarah through her son, Isaac. It's Jewish land. And it's not just Jewish land that is uh, encompassed in the borders of what we now see as Israel. That Jewish land extends through much of the Middle East. It's Jewish land for Jewish people. And there should be no one more aware of that today than us, born-again believers. In spite of what the secular Jews of Israel believe, and in spite of what those Christians who subscribe to uh, the heresy known as replacement theology believe, you and I know that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. And Jerusalem is his capital. And just like at the time of Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem on that first Palm Sunday, we here today are part of the minority. There were very few who truly knew him that day. There were many who proclaimed to know him, who proclaimed to be his followers, but as you will see in the next several minutes, that was not the case. The true believers then and now are a remnant, but it should not ever stop us from being heard. We have a message to proclaim, and Jesus told us to occupy until he comes. And above all else, we're Christians trusting in the Lord Jesus as Lord and Savior. So that's where our allegiance should be. That is where it should lie. Most of the Jews of the first century got it wrong. 
They didn't know to what kingdom they belonged. And it's because of that that they didn't recognize their king who was in the midst of them. They wanted an earthly king. And so they rebelled. But you know, we, we still often do the same thing, don't we? There's a fine line between knowing and not knowing. The word discernment means knowing what is true from that which is almost true. Head knowledge and heart commitment. There's a big difference between the two. We think we're on the right page when we have this, but we couldn't be further away. We've been called to do one thing as Christians, as believers, and that is to spread the gospel of Christ. It's the only job description we have, the only thing that we've been called to do. Matthew 28, where we get the Great Commission, does not say anything about electing Christians to public office. It doesn't say anything about overturning Roe versus Wade or fighting global warming. They're important issues. Well, maybe not that last one so much. But they are consuming countless hours and dollars from well-meaning Christians. Christians whose hearts are sincere. There's nothing wrong with those things. But where is our priority? Our allegiance is often misplaced. There are Christian leaders out there in the world who have who have thousands of followers and they're following them down rabbit trails instead of getting out in the streets and proclaiming the gospel. There's a Christian movement that's been around for a while known as Reconstructionism. It's all about making the world a better place so that Jesus would want to return. As if we could control any of that. Well, it sounds nice to many people, but it's not scriptural. Christian hearts get so proud. Jesus' kingdom is about winning souls. Always has been, always will be. Not environmental awards. And so people who follow those paths are no better than the Pharisees that were around during Jesus' time. Or the others who were just following the crowd that day. Today, we would probably call them nominal Christians, following Jesus just to see what's in it for them. What might we be able to gain from this? And when the persecution comes, as it will if you're a true believer, they disappear. They head for the hills. The same people who cried, Hosanna! to our Lord as he rode into Jerusalem. Five days later, we're screaming, crucify him. They were not of his kingdom. And sadly, again, many who would call themselves Christians today are not either. We need to recognize our king. Then maybe we'll be able to determine to which kingdom we belong. On the verge of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, there were very clearly two factions lining up to greet him. And his arrival was evoking quite a demonstration. He fully realized that the enthusiasm of the masses would enrage the hostile leaders the Pharisees in Jerusalem, to the point that they would desire more than ever to carry out their plot against him. Their plot, of course, was to put him to death. In fact, their timetable was being moved up because of the crowd's enthusiasm. We see from verses 14 and 15 that Mike read for us that Jesus rode into Jerusalem that day sitting on the foal or a young colt of a donkey. He was fulfilling the prophecy 
that we read in Zechariah 9, verse 9, where it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass, upon a colt, the foal of an ass. Well, the, the crowds clearly miss the symbolism of this. He didn't come riding into town on a stallion. He was sitting on a donkey. Kings don't ride on donkeys. Nowhere around the world will you see any monarch riding a donkey. It's an animal that's hardly associated with the rigors of war. You don't ride in a battle on a donkey. Donkeys, on the other hand, were associated with the pursuits of peace and quite befitting for the Prince of Peace. But the people didn't recognize this. They were not able to see it because their minds were filled with earthly ideas for their king. Again, we get caught up in human wisdom. That's not a good place to be. But the prophecy in Zechariah 9 is quite clear that Jesus is indeed king of the Jews. It says he is just and having salvation. So there's your Messiah. There's your Savior, your perfect Redeemer, lowly, riding into town on a donkey. That is very humbling. But again, it's what had been foretold. Not everyone who sees Jesus back then and now recognizes him for who he really is. The people who came with him from Bethany, you recall, that's where Lazarus lived. They had seen him call Lazarus out of the grave, Mike read for us in verse 17. Don't you think that was on their minds? That was fresh in their remembrance. He, he brought a man out of the grave who had been there for days. He'd been there long enough that he was really starting to smell bad. That's a memory that you would keep with you, I would think, the rest of your life. Jesus called him out of the grave. They spread their garments in his path, which was befitting of royalty. Others cut down palm branches from trees so that they might pave the way before him. Meanwhile, there was a whole caravan of pilgrims that had previously arrived in Jerusalem. Verse 20 tells us the Greeks were part of that. They came out to greet him. People were coming from all directions. It was the Passover. They were coming to town to take part in that. A lot of people lining the streets that day. And they all came together to meet Jesus. So all this enthusiasm was just mounting and mounting. People were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Again, the people who had been in Bethany and saw Lazarus raised from the grave, I'm sure they were going around telling everybody about that. Look what he has done. You get a sense of the excitement that was going on that day. It was really reaching a fever pitch. And the Pharisees, they're always around. They're still around today. You can, you can see them. You just have to look. They were beside themselves with envy. They wanted to be in charge. They wanted to be the leader of the people. So they appealed to Jesus, stop the cheering. Luke tells us in chapter 19, verses 39 and 40, they said, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And of course, you all know what Jesus' answer to that was. He said, I tell you, if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. You see, the stones, rocks, are not proud. They're just there. But they're creations of God. And the stones would have honored the Messiah, whereas prideful man would not. 
in hailing Jesus as the Messiah, the people were right. And the scribes and the Pharisees were wrong. But all of the people were not right. Again, they're grouped separately from the Pharisees, but not everybody, again, who calls themselves a Christian really is. Some of them were not off by much. Again, just about the distance from here to here, from your heart, your head rather, to your heart. It's a short distance, really, on earth, isn't it? About 18 inches. But it can make all the difference in eternity. Like many people today, those folks were looking for an earthly Messiah. Someone to be an earthly king. It was miserable living back then under Roman rule. They wanted to be freed from that. They were waiting for their king to come and set them free from their worldly troubles. Well, I'll tell you, as we get closer to the end of time here on earth, people will find the earthly Messiah that they've been looking for. His name is Antichrist. And they'll be so glad to see him. So glad that they will fall down and worship him. They will take his mark upon their hand or their forehead, and with it they'll be doomed for eternity. All because they're looking for the wrong Savior. They don't recognize Jesus for who he is. Do you know anybody like that today? You probably have some acquaintances that are following down the wrong path. Maybe you did as well at one point. Those people in Jerusalem that first Palm Sunday wanted Jesus to be an earthly king. And because of that, they could not have been true believers. Jesus didn't come to be an earthly king the first time. If they were true believers, they would have understood the scriptures. Good religious Jewish people knew the scriptures. Again, they may have misinterpreted them at times, but they were in the word of God. But most people were just jumping on an emotional bandwagon, looking for a general to come in and wage war against their Roman oppressors. They wanted peace, but at what cost? That's the question we must ask. We must still ask that today. People are so willing to give up their freedoms, their liberties, for a little bit of peace, or what they think is peace. The only lasting peace comes when God is first reconciled to man. It's only then that man can be reconciled to his fellow man. So that's why Jesus didn't come galloping in on a horse to expect This Messiah of 2,000 years ago, not yet the Lion of Judah, but the Lamb of God, to expect him to reveal himself as a political earthly king, the Hosanna shouters were just wrong. They were as wrong as the Pharisees. The Pharisees who rejected Jesus were committing a crime. But so too were those who cheered and were outwardly accepting of him. They didn't have Christ in their hearts. They were doing him a gross injustice because they did not, and they did not want to accept him for who he really was. It's not surprising then that Luke pictures a weeping king in the midst of this multitude. Wouldn't it be something? I mean, you're welcoming someone you've been waiting for all your life. And he tells you who he is, but when it's not what you want him to be, you reject him. Sad. Nor is it surprising that when the people realize 
just a little later that Jesus is not the Messiah that they want, again, the one to God we've created in our own mind, then they change their shouts from Hosanna to crucify him. Again, no different than now 2,000 years later, so-called Christians today who don't like the God of the Bible, they recreate him in their own image or they forget him altogether so they can justify their sin. I'm always referring you back to the last part of Romans 1. That's who we're talking about. Those verses from uh, Romans 1.18 to the end of the chapter, they could be today's headlines. That's how people are right now concerning the Lord. But we know Jesus had some very important business to take care of that week. That week that he was in Jerusalem. He went there on a mission. It was a mission from before the foundation of the world. It was all part of the Father's plan. He had come to Jerusalem for the purpose of salvation. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And his only begotten son came to Jerusalem to die. And even though he wasn't the knight in shining armor that many wanted him to be that day, he was still the king of Israel, as our text refers to him in verse 13. If anyone thought that they were controlling what was going on that week as Jesus was making preparations to go to the cross, they were sadly mistaken. As Jesus would tell a rather smug, conscious Pilate a few days later on Good Friday when Pilate was trying to exert his authority, how foolish must he have looked. Jesus said you wouldn't have any power at all if it wasn't first given to you from above. He also said in John 10, no man takes my life. No one took Jesus' life from him that Good Friday. Only he has the power to lay it down and to take it up again. That sounds like a king to me. If he didn't want to be put to death, he wouldn't have been. Nobody could have overridden that. During that week in Jerusalem, Jesus went to the Mount of Olives where he spoke privately to his disciples, speaking as the authority from heaven, which he was, of course. He was there to tell them about his second coming as the king who everyone was looking for. In Matthew 25, 31, he said, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory with all the angels with him and with us. True believers will return with Jesus as well. Then, he said, he shall sit on the throne of his glory. Well, again, that's the Messiah that the Jews were looking for 2,000 years ago when he rode into Jerusalem on the back of that donkey. Only next time, next time when he comes in, Instead of coming to save, he'll be coming to judge. Zechariah tells us in chapter 14, verse 4, that his feet shall stand upon the Mount of Olives, right on the same spot from which he left. That is where he will return. This is the great anticipation for believers today. First, the rapture of his church, and then the glorious appearing with his church. And when Jesus returns to earth in his glory, he will set up his kingdom of righteousness, which will encircle the earth as the waters cover the sea. Justice will finally be served. When Jesus came the first time, it was as a lamb, not to judge the world. He came to save the world. When he comes again, it will be as a lion to judge it and to take his rightful place in his earthly kingdom. So you want to talk about anticipation? 
That's something to look forward to. When he rode into Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, the people were expecting the beginning of a royal kingdom. Well, as believers today, that's what our future holds. And again, being on this side of the cross, first of all, we're without excuse being on this side of the cross. We have it all laid out for us. But we also have a wonderful vantage point from where we are. We not only understand Jesus' first entry that day into Jerusalem, but we also know the reason for his second entry. And we can certainly read the signs of the times. I mentioned earlier the Palestinians that seem to forever be in the mix over there and the plans that they have. With the world's approval, they plan on assuming control of the nation of Israel. They plan on making Jerusalem their capital. And not one nation on earth you can't find one nation everywhere, anywhere rather, on earth that has announced that they will stand by Israel. We did, but don't expect Joe Biden to follow President Trump's lead. Let me close by looking to the past for a glimpse of the future. Zechariah 12.3 says that the day will come when Jerusalem will be a burdensome stone for all people. Every nation and all that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. Again, the events of today are working together to bring that about. It's not always obvious. If you could see the big picture, you would see all around the world things are happening. Pieces are falling into place. Whenever it happens, and, and it will, it is getting closer. Make your election sure. If you haven't placed your trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, do it now. Tomorrow's not promised to anyone. I did the funeral for our sister Colleen Conroy Hickman this past Monday night. And I said basically the same thing to the people in the crowd. And I said, if you haven't made this decision for Christ, what are you waiting for? Some of you might not be here tomorrow. Trust that his shed blood on the cross on that Good Friday paid the penalty for your sins. Only his blood could. That is the only agent that God has provided to effectively cleanse you from your sins. You cannot enter heaven with the stain of sin on your soul. It will not survive there. So admit that you're a sinner. Ask him to forgive you and to save you from an eternity in hell. Only he can do that. Only he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And then Please come back this Friday for our Good Friday service at 7 p.m. as we remember what he did for us on that first trip into Jerusalem. Father in heaven, we are grateful. It's all been laid out for us to see. It's all documented as having truly happened. It is just to us whether or not to believe. So, Lord, move on our hearts. Again, if there are any here today who are not trusting in the shed blood of Christ, I pray that you would convict them, that you would trouble them, dear Lord, until they have their eyes opened, until through the measure of faith that you have given them, they make that profession that Christ is Lord and Savior. Lord, if, if not now, when? If not this week, when? Lord, again, we're grateful for all that you have given us in your holy word. What a, what a road map that's been laid out. Thank you, dear Lord, for your love, which was so great that while we are yet in our sins, 
Christ came and died for us. Give us a good week this week, Lord. Keep us focused on you. We should be focused on you the other 51 weeks as well. But Lord, this week in particular, when the word or the name of Christ rather is in the public sphere, where we can talk about what Jesus has done and perhaps bring comfort to someone else who's struggling out there as we once were. Thank you, Lord, for your everlasting word. Bless us now as we depart. We ask it all in Christ's name. Amen.